So today on a couple of pointers podcasts, we're lucky enough to have Veronica Fernandes, the channel partnership manager at Aircall. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you, Ricky. Thanks for having me. So I'm super excited to talk to you. There's quite a few things I want to talk to you about, and I think the audience is going to be particularly interested in. Well, I'm excited but, too. Uh, so let's, why don't we start at the beginning? Right. Tell me about how you got into sales. How I got into sales. I guess no one gets into sales. No one chooses to get into sales. It's like, <laughs> I just fell into it. I actually did sort of made a choice to go into sales. So I have a background in law and public policy. I'm from Mexico, was working for an NGO in Mexico, anti-corruption, then came here to Australia and started work to do a master's degree. And then I was trying to find a job in my field, but obviously it's different. It's law. We don't have the same law. And I was like, okay, just be realistic. Like you might need to explore something else. And one of my friends was like, Hey V, I think you'd be really good at sales. Why don't you give it a, like a crack? And I was like, uh, I'm not sure sales that rep. And I was like, a believer of those things that they say but yeah. then I said like look if I don't give it a try like I'd always be wondering and as well like I want to get a job I want to see what it yeah. is like to like, work what here yeah. exactly what are you gonna do you gotta get a job exactly so I was like yes I'll give it a try I think I'll be good at it and yes let's do it so that's when I decided to start looking into sales and then someone reached out from my call and yes, that's how it happened. So a few interesting things there, like the one that, that I picked up on as well is how when hiring immigrants, you get access to a, a much like higher talent level, so to speak, or a higher education level. Because We have people that move here from India with an MBA and they're struggling to find a job here. So they might take an entry level sales role, whereas an Australian with an MBA, not looking for the same thing. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. All right, so you got into sales at Aircall and you landed yourself in one, I mean, Aircall sells, you know, telephone products, basically. Yeah. Right? It's like a voice server. So you landed in, not going to be primarily email focused in their outbound. Yeah. They're going to be cold calling. Right? <laughs> They're going to drink their own Kool-Aid there. 100%. <laughs> so you landed in like the phone -thon of cold outbound companies, right? Exactly right. What was that like? That would have been pretty jarring. Oh my God, I'm not gonna lie, it was scary. I was like, why did I do this? Like, at the, to be fair, you know what helps? The VP, I don't know if you know this, the VP and air call in general, so the VP is French, and mm -hmm. air call in general is just like, there's people from everywhere. So that in the start helps. I'm like, if he's a VP and he's yeah. like such a gun and has such yeah. a thick accent, then I have a chance to like, do something yeah. here <laughs> it's amazing that that diversity all the way to the top kind of yeah. encourages it all the way to the bottom which is nice 100 percent. so that was one thing that like and he interviewed me so that just sort of did that and yeah. the ground the second thing i guess the challenge was as well internally i was as you said i was like i have a master's degree and i'm in the most junior sales like ego so just killing that ego and being like who cares like no one cares, you know, you have new, like this new challenge, this new target, like just go and get it. Like stop thinking about, oh, is this the right thing? Mm. And I guess the third thing, and you were one of my first cold calls. Do you remember yeah. that? Yes. I, I remember that very clearly, getting that cold call from you. <laughs> and I'd previously been prospected by one of your colleagues. Yeah. And I remember straight away thinking, I'd offer this Veronica a job. <laughs> Right, like that, that's where I do most of my recruitment is I just wait for good callers to call me and I'll be like, hey, is this call being recorded? Bloody hell, calling from air call, I knew it would be. But uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so that, uh, I guess the most challenging part for me was like obviously learning the job. I had never done sales. They took a chance on me. There's huge pressure. Like I want to, yeah. like I want to succeed. But also like uh, realizing that I didn't have to be so hyper personalized. You try to do this research and be like super different and stand out and yeah. you really don't have like, you really don't have to take that much time or spend that much time into we doing recently all those did, uh, We recently did an exercise where we had an SDR who was spending like a good hour researching each company. 
and really good work, like super amazing research. And then we would actually read the emails and listen to the phone calls. And none of that personalized, like none of that research was actually being used. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the point? Like, you're just talking to the same CFO about the same pain points, regardless Mm -hmm. of if you spent an hour researching it. But that comes with experience, right? To begin with, you kind of, uh, you want to do everything perfectly. Yeah. And just letting that go as well. So you just nailed it. You want to do everything perfectly. And that, that's certainly me, my, my family, like da- my dad is like a perfectionist. I've always been not a perfectionist, but yes, like so a, a bit hard on myself. And so that was something that was pointed out really early. Even management were like, hey, you need to like trust yourself. You're good at it. Like stop being hard on yourself and just give it a go. And uh, yeah, but I guess something that helped me and I know a lot of people are like scripts are horrible and you shouldn't use them and having a script is like having a security blanket like having your best mate going into a party and being like oh if I don't know what to say you'll help me like just having it there and opening a call with the same sort of talk track comes natural obviously we're all smart like we all know some of the pains we hear them every day so if you trust that like opening every single day and you do it for a few weeks then that that just makes it easy and just having the script to me was a game changer because I was like Mm. oh don't have the script or whatever just having it there was like okay I can go and you see but you have the attributes for that I know two things about you and those two things would be enough for you to get a job at Pointer (laughs) you're a dog you're a dog person and you're a runner (laughs) 100% (laughs) That's all I need to know because if you're a runner, it means you challenge yourself with your own personal goals mm. and it's you against yourself. But right? unless you're like a professional athlete, it's always just about how you ran last week. Are you running a little bit further? Are you running a little bit faster? So you, you've got that intrinsic motivation. You're also a little bit of a, a little bit of a masochist because like running's not fun. Like, let's be honest, like it hurts. You know, like you're dealing with sore knees. You're dealing with a stiff neck. You're dealing with sore feet. Like, but all of these attributes kind of are the reasons why and it's also discipline and routine mm. so like you fine with the call scripts i have sdrs so like every call they make is a new bloody script and i'm like guys what are you doing like just say the same thing it's so easy yeah. but they can't they don't have the patience yeah that was yeah that was a huge thing for me so my new manager well not new manager like he's been at Elk for like eight months but he came in June, his name is Ellis, and he is super experienced. Uh, He was a head of sales at a big company and he just has like a lot of experience. And one of the things when I was really, I took like a couple of months, not a couple of months, a couple of weeks off and uh, coming back to work, just like I felt like everything I had built was just like, I didn't know where it was and stuff like that. That's the same as running. You lose that momentum, your fitness. Exactly. Yeah, 100%. And he was like, okay, V, tell me what you're doing. Okay, maybe you are spending too much time in this. Just trust me. Let's do a little bit more velocity. Try it for a couple of months and let's see how you go. And I was like, okay, what do I need to do? And that's one of the things I guess, like going to your manager and saying like, I am struggling 100%. If your manager is not helping you or you just don't match with your manager, Go to someone else, go to your VP, go to the director of sales, like go to someone else. If the person you report to doesn't give you what you need, like it's in your hands to find that. Let me dig in a little bit there because you were at a, essentially at an enterprise or mid-market company selling mostly into enterprises. It's a big business now, Aircorn. Do you think you could have succeeded in the role if you didn't have an SDR manager and a whole team around you? Nah, Uh, I don't know. No, I don't think so. I mean, what do you mean by like a direct manager? I didn't have one for a while. So like so often, (laughs) I mean, the majority of SDRs are being hired as a solo SDR. So they don't have Mm. four other SDRs that have already been in the team and 30 other SDRs around the world who have already refined a talk track and everything. Yeah, They like the first sales hire. They've just yeah. got the found. They've got the founder to report to, or like a senior salesperson who's had relationships in the industry. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to understand like how instrumental having that like 
that team and that management was to you being able to succeed? So I guess that's, there's two things to that. You need to realize what, I mean, Echo, yes, is a global company, 800 people around the world. But in Australia, when I joined, we were, I think I was 25, 23rd, something like that. We act as like a little startup because like we're all the way here. They sometimes yeah. forget that we exist. Yeah. And for a They're bit, classic. I didn't have a manager. People know I have really good friends from Echo. Hannah was a really good friend that um, we sort of like bonded since the start. She was another BDR. She's yeah. moved on now, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So that certainly helped. But if I didn't have those people and I didn't have a direct manager for a while, I was going to the VP. I was like, you know this thing about the cost of inaction that you want me to get? I just don't get it. So I cannot get it out of the person because I don't understand what that means. And I was like, tell me what that means for you. And a lot of the times I guess like, if you sit next to a founder and he hears you making those calls and you're not getting it, yeah. it's his business. I doubt he will be like, you know what, go to a room and stop bothering me. Like yeah. he'll be happy that you're next to him and he'll be happy to provide feedback, but you have to be open and like willing to make that change. So yeah, yeah having the team 100% helps because it keeps your spirits up and stuff, but there's a bunch of other people help you to get there. Whoever is in the company, they're most likely going to be facing the like the, the issues that your buyer is going to be facing or they're going to be facing like issues that you'll be talking to them about. So, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I guess, you know, I guess it takes your attributes to want to solve problems and that humility that you spoke about and having the people available to help and support you. 100%. Um, now, I guess you joined then. You're uh, you're an immigrant. You don't get the Aussie culture necessarily, very different business culture. You're working for a, a French company. Where's Aircall based? Is it France? Yeah, France, yeah. So you're working for a French company, again, very different cultures, and you've got a thick Mexican accent. Yeah, let me know, fine. I don't mean thick as an insulting way. I'm just saying, like, this is how every, oh, every immigrant lands. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> did, like, did that make you feel very insecure and self conscious? Yeah, at times, yes. And at times I would cry and I would hate my accent and wish it wasn't there. Like, yeah, not gonna lie. And then I guess I'm quite, a, I can be a vulnerable person and you can know when I'm happy, when I'm stressed, when I'm angry, it's like mm. quite visible. So I did share that with people. Like, and I did like, when I had those situations, I would be like, damn, this accent really makes me feel insecure. Like I'm gonna, I even turned around one day and said like, I think I'm gonna take like public speaking classes or something cause I, like I just block myself. And like just yeah. expressing that, sort of like having someone around you knowing that you're going through that just creates mm -hmm. a huge like, sort of like awareness for them that mm -hmm. you're going through something, if you don't express that, same thing, if you're struggling with something but you don't express it to anyone, yeah. how are they meant to know? So, mm. so yeah, it did happen, but as you said, having people around who understood it and then laughing about it, I mean, we sometimes have those days where we feel down and yeah, it affects you, yeah. the next day you can laugh and say like, ah, oh, sorry, but English is a second language. <laughs> tell me about how, Besides for your confidence, right? So this is how it uh, impacted you uh, internally. I guess, do you have any insights into how it impacted outcomes? Right now, obviously, if you're an account executive or in your new role, and we can discuss how it is in your new role soon, um, your attributes, your intellects, your skills all shine through. But in the first three seconds of a cold call, people don't get that. Yeah. Did you feel like, uh, you know, we often joke Australians are casually racist. Do you feel like it was an actual impediment to success in Outbound, having an accent in Australia? I mean, to be fair, uh, I don't know to what extent. I did get and I still get people saying like, oh, sorry, where are you based or where are you or you're not from here. Obviously you have an accent. Uh, do you have someone local 
or even one day I took a call and they were like, oh, I spoke to someone in nature and she didn't know what she was talking about or something like that. Yeah. And my, my, my colleague was like, oh no, she's actually from Mexico and she's just sitting next to me. Like they would get yeah. angry. So I guess it did. But if you, uh, I guess when you're, when that's happening to you, it's yeah. like when you're, you took the, the example of running, but you can take it, anyone can take it in whatever they want to sort of like, in whatever they find a challenge. Like if you keep digging into how that is affecting you and oh, they're not picking the phone because probably I have an accent then that just feels the insecurity. If when you're running, you dig into like, I'm tired, I can't feel my legs, oh, yeah. I want to stop then you'll start feeling that more. So you'll sort of create that for you. So again, it comes back to like, surround yourself with people who will champion you when you have that tough call and they tell you that, externalize it. And yeah, I don't know if the outcomes did happen, but I guess they didn't because now I'm in a new role. Yeah, you got, you got uh, promoted. I mean, yes. You got so... promoted, but it really does sound to me like you're really fortunate to- oh, yeah. Um, land at a company that was globalized. You know, they, 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 they French. They're not going to think like a Spanish accent or a Mexican accent is anything other than normal. Whereas Australia, there's a little bit of a homogenized culture here. Although, 100%. you know, maybe Melbourne's, yeah, without getting into it, I often feel like <coughs> there's a real challenge for immigrants. I've got a dirty South African accent. I don't feel it ever held, held me back, but I also have the privilege of being like a middle class white male. Like I maybe yeah. just don't, I just don't feel these things. And I, so I'm always curious when I put a job out now, if I get 99 applicants, 99 applicants in Australia, 60 will be immigrants. And I wonder how much they struggle more so than the locals. I guess that's when, when you need to measure like other attributes. And I did have a chat with a sales leader the other day from American Express and he was like oh my god my best sellers are from south america because that accent and the tone and blah 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 like it eventually yeah. gets them to like it's a charm or whatever and like i don't know i guess i guess yes obviously i have to say like when i started looking for a job it took me a long time and yes being an immigrant was like sorry no we don't want we want someone local even the and i don't want to throw air call under the bus or anything but even the ad for the the bdr role said native english speaker mm -hmm. and when i read that that i only read that after so because i was approached by someone about the job in air call i actually didn't see it on the website and then applied <laughs> yeah. but when i saw that later that thing came into my head like did they put that because Probably they said after me, I'm not doing a good job. Like, obviously it yeah, played on my mind. And the, my friends and, were like, V, you're crazy. No. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting because native English speaker versus first language speaking capabilities, very different. There's, I'll often have clients say, you know, hire a pointer doesn't offshore anything. But if you are prospecting in Australia, we'll hire an Australian rep. Non-negotiable. Yeah. Non, non Usually we have like, like we have a Canadian living in Japan, who doesn't mm -hmm. speak Japanese, working for an Australian company. Like that's fine, in accents, nobody here cares. Yeah. But clients often say to me, you hire locally? I'm like, yeah, hire locally. Uh, would you be fine with Akbar? He's in Melbourne. And they're like, yeah. mm, do, you have like a, do you have like a clearance? Do you have like Gary in yeah. Melbourne? You know, yeah. they're very interested in accents. And discriminating based on accent when your role is voice-based, yes. you know, it's kind of like, like an actor, like, oh, we want a British accent for this role. Yeah, uh, I want, it's a very interesting space, but uh, one of our top performers is Iranian. Yeah, you know, uh, studied in the UK, so he's got a very British twang to his Iranian, and lives in Perth, so he's got now an Amer uh, an Australian twang on a British <laughs> twang of an Iranian accent, and he's still like he just rocks meetings out like I can't believe. We're always like, how did he do it? But <clears throat> anyway, and on the same topic, yeah, tell me about being a female in sales, like. This is a very male dominated industry, particularly when you get to sales leadership. How, how have you felt as being a female in the sales industry? Look, I guess, uh, I guess uh, coming from a, back, a Mexican background, 
I think I see things in Australia in the sunnier side. <laughs> so definitely in Mexico, we have more of a macho culture. We, I mean, not the typical stereotypical one, but even let's say like, we have more hierarchical structures at mm -hmm. work. So like you would always like write like dear sir, madam or whatever. You would never refer to people like on the first person at yeah. first. So to me coming to this, it was actually a struggle. Like so horizontal and just sending emails like hi to straight to the point. Like, you know, like yeah, hey I, mate, cheers. Exactly. Yeah. So that to me, yeah. The second thing I think as women, I guess there's two things. One, I cry a lot and I know a lot of women don't and it's not a women thing, but I cry a lot. I'm angry or I'm frustrated or I'm feeling stressed and I cry and it's something I don't like. I dislike crying. I was in a meeting with my manager like a few months back and I just like, I don't know, I was feeling very stressed and vulnerable and like not comfortable, not with him, but mm -hmm. just like with like the numbers and the information and it was, I don't know, you, well, you know, you're just like yeah. not feeling comfortable. Yeah. And, Sales and is an uncomfortable job. Exactly. And I just started crying and he was like, oh my God, V, if you need to stop the meeting, that's fine. Like we can do it. I was like, I need you to continue. Like, and he was like, no, like you're crying. You're not okay. I was like, I am okay. I need you to continue. Like, because if that's, I know that's not uh, like, I'm crying mm. because I'm not okay, but you need to also ex like be vulnerable to share that, like, yeah, and sort of like make that self knowledge or self uh, like mm. become that get that self consciousness to realize like sometimes when I'm stressed, sometimes when I feel overwhelmed or whatever, I'm gonna cry. That doesn't mean that I need time off. Sometimes what helps yeah. me is for you to keep going or for you to explain that's... to me. But that's what I said, like, look, this is what happens. And when that happens, unless I tell you, yes, I need a break, I need you to keep going. And that will just like calm yeah. me down. I think that's um, one of your other, obviously must be one of your other really strong attributes is emotional awareness. It's, uh, I feel you really need that emotional awareness in sales because it's a, it's an emotional roller coaster. Sometimes I do wish I had less emotional awareness because I had a colleague who just couldn't feel rejection, almost like a psychopath. Everything, like everything just washed off him. Mm. And he was a great salesperson because of it, <coughs> or a great prospector at least. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it definitely sounds like your experience at Aircall in particular has been really favorable. They're a mature organization, great culture, great values. And now you've taken up a new role there. Yes, I've taken up a so, new role. <laughs> Tell me, you've gone now into sales from law, from politics, from policy, <laughs> into sales. You became a, an SDR or BDR, whatever they call it at Aircall. Yeah. Now you're in partnerships channel, which is like this weird word that um, everyone know. uses. And it's a completely different side of revenue generation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that was one of the reasons why. So obviously all the metrics, all the numbers, everything you measure is different to a BDR. And that's one of the reasons why I was crying in that meeting. I was like, I'm not getting anything and I'm stressed and I want to like be good. He's like, oh my God, you're running at a million hours per hour, like a million kilometers per hour, like calm down. So yes, so uh, channel sales, I know it's not sort of like super known, not even internally at Echo. <laughs> so um, I mean, it is for us who are in channel, but it's a different side of partnership. Yeah. So. I guess it looks different to different orgs, but um, so Airco is a partnerships-led organization. And one of the reasons why we're like that, it's because our biggest strength is that our phone system integrates with a bunch of business tools. So those business tools are our technology or alliances integrations, but people have to implement those tools. So, so you have these other businesses who are like tech consultants or mm -hmm. Salesforce implementators or agencies that implement those systems and that's channel sales. So I manage a group of different th of those businesses specifically for Salesforce and Monday.com. So, so yeah, it's different and it changes, but it's so exciting and I love it. It's more of a, like, it's still a hunting 
our role because I need to find those partners. Are they the right partners, etc. And uh, and obviously love more relationships into, though. Yeah, you get them into the partner program, but as well, well then after you need to find deals from them, and so it's mm -hmm. like it's a farming and a hunting. So it's a mix of yeah. both. I like it. Yeah, it's a very exciting thing. It can also be, I guess, frustrating when your partners aren't pushing hard and you've got a, it's kind of like where SDRs are being held to revenue numbers, but there's an account executive who's actually accountable for the revenue. Yeah. You as a panel, a channel partnership sales rep, you've, you're responsible for revenue, but your partner has to kind of facilitate yeah. the sale. <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. And it makes a lot of sense. Like partnership was... I think community was the word for 2022 mm -hmm. and partnership is the word for 2023. Yeah. I think everyone's looking at partnerships. Are you involved in just partnership sales? Do you also get involved in partnership in co-innovation or co-marketing or is it yeah. just co-selling? So I do both. So I do, I mean, I don't do marketing, but we do have a partner marketing manager and we work, she's part of like the partnership team, obviously the, the marketing team. So we work together to make sure that we're delivering content to our partners and that they have all the content they need. I guess the difference is like, yeah, it's sales, but it's also a little bit of enablement because like yeah. they can't know all the business tools. Of course, that sounds exactly like enablement. Yeah, so, so it's like a bit of like training their teams, but also knowing how they, they do sales how they implement mm. and just yeah it's a mix of a lot of things and it, it's nice it's really exciting it sounds like a real generalist role as a seller where you need a little bit of management because you're helping them manage their deals you need like a little bit of strategy a little bit of sales enablement and coaching and training a little bit of outbound a little bit yeah. of everything really it seems <laughs> like seems like a phenomenal sales role and i think it it's uh, it's exciting and uh, i guess all those attributes that we spoke about before that you maybe felt were inhibiting your ability to sell in earlier on in your career, I imagine would be like amazing attributes now. Like now mm. you can bring your legal background and that strategic thinking around policy to how do we create influence? I think your accents, uh, what's the word? It's endearing and memorable. I think like all of these things kind of now become like qualities that you can admire as opposed to thing you feel is holding you back. Yeah, so, 100%. I mean, you just like, to me, this is a success story of an immigrant moved to Australia, qualified, what humbly went into sales, um, the hardest role out there, uh, phone based outbound, uh, SaaS, built your way up, moved into now a more senior role, a more strategic role, and still at the beginning of your career. Yeah, I know. I love that. And I love the fact that exactly what you say, like, if you trust the process and you trust and you let your ego just like, be there and be somewhere else it's like you i was like oh my god i got to create a new career like who gets that chance oh like mm -hmm. it's insane i don't know it's just like you get to be this whole new person that no yeah. one yeah and you chose that so yeah it's quite i don't know it's like like you decided to start your business and like you try things and if they don't work who cares like what you're doing on LinkedIn and what you're doing on the podcast and everything, it, it takes a little bit of guts. And yes, you feel that fear. But if you get stuck on like the fear, then you never feel the emotion. You know how they say like yeah. they're the opposite, but the same um, yeah. tr uh, mental or emotional trigger. So, yeah. Amazing. Cool. Well, I've loved, <laughs> so I've loved watching your journey um, oh, since, you. since I was one of your first cold calls. <laughs> all the way through to now it's an incredible it's an incredible story and i think like really inspirational you know there's a lot of young females there's a lot of young female immigrants there's a lot of just young people in general looking to get into sales feel what you felt all those insecurities whether they got an accent whether it's a gender issue whatever everyone has their bloody insecurities and how you've overcome that i think is a remarkable story and if anyone's listening to this you know follow veronica you don't post as much as you used to when you're in outbound i'm doing it now again you know what someone told me that and i did i do take that i yeah. uh, i post because i was finding it hard in my new role and i was like i need to send like good foundations to be able mm -hmm. to succeed so i'm back i'm back amazing like <laughs> and you know what you don't even have to post about partnerships like i think just people want to hear your story 
right? Mm-hmm. Like your story is incredible. And the people are in your network. Like Hannah's story is incredible. Yeah. And Irwin, you mentioned your, your manager when you came. His story is incredible. And your mm. VP of sales, Definitely. all of it's pretty incredible. Um, Air calls incredible. We don't use it, but it was a very strong contender when you were considering. Yeah. <laughs> what? I know. Very, very <laughs> strong contender, you know. But anyway, Veronica, it's been such a pleasure chatting to you. If somebody wanted to wanted to talk to you what's the best way to get hold of you yes i was gonna say that and like good that you brought it up so obviously always feel free to like send me a dm or just yeah just send me a message on linkedin uh you can always also send me my send an email but what i was gonna say is yeah, we started as a coco right and we're here like almost two years after so yeah. like Two people doing it is like you never know who you might meet on those cold calls or who you might meet on LinkedIn or whatever. Like, I guess the biggest thing is like reach out to people and just like farm those relationships because it's just really incredible what, what, what you both get out of it. And they might be experiencing the same thing that you are or they might be able to guide you in a way. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, it really just gave me the chills when you said that. Like this year, two years later is all because you cold (laughs) called me and that's amazing it's amazing to think of what can happen when people are put themselves out there they brave they humble you know and willing to try so really so inspirational and i really appreciate you giving me the time to talk to me and anyone who's going to watch this no thank you thank you it was so good to chat to you ricky and uh, i'll definitely be chatting to you again in the next roles when you can explain to me what the what partnership channel is again.